The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Essentially, we have lived in inside of an illusion. And when you begin to mature in the Word of God, you understand that this life really is an illusion. And our perception of this life is controlled by those who have formed it. It's an illusion. And we, what we have to do, if we band together, if we stick together, if we actually employ the principles of Jesus Christ to one another, we can get through a great many things. We can mitigate many circumstances. We can offer security for those who have them. There are a great many things that we can do, but we just actually have to do it. We have to learn to say to each other, okay, you're my brother, you're my sister in Jesus Christ, but more than in Jesus Christ, you are in fact my brother and sister. For some people, that's an excuse. Well, you're my brother in Christ. Outside of Christ, you're not my brother. That's not very genuine to me. Have you ever noticed that friends outside the body of Christ have a stronger bond than the friends inside the body of Christ? How in the world is that possible? You see, outside the body of Christ, soldiers, and if, if you guys know any soldiers, you understand that they always say they cannot find a camaraderie in the brotherhood that they found inside the military services. One key factor to that is that they celebrate together. Most importantly, they suffer together. You see, everybody's wearing the same uniform. Visually, you don't judge from an outward appearance. It's not important to talk about somebody's shortcomings. It's important to know them so that you can take up the slack. You operate as a unit. You function together. And you know that if somebody is weak in a certain area, somebody else has to pick up the slack. When you begin to think in those, in that uh, perspective, with that perspective, you're not a person who's so, you're not judgmental anymore. You become a person of work, of doing. You want to see things work. You'll work towards a goal and so forth. And this is what we need to do. Essentially, inside the body of Christ, we have to develop or let loose those skills that are inside of us. But Satan is real sneaky. What he has done from our youth is attempt to destroy any trust that we may have with another person. This is what he does. I'm saying right now, that is not going to work with me. If a person backstabs me, so be it. They backstab me. But while they're not backstabbing me, I'm going to say thank God for them and continue doing something. I, I tell you, Satan cannot work in an environment of unconditional love by a human being. That love is something else that's very difficult to define by human terms. It encompasses too much. And for far too long, we have allowed the world to define us instead of letting God define us. He designed us. He predestined us. Why not go to the source, the creator of the owner's manual, and find out who you really are? That's what we need to do. We can't let Satan step in and cause the division only works when you pay attention to it, by the way. If you don't pay attention to division, if you don't entertain the enemy, it won't work. Good people can be used by the enemy. Not to say that the enemy has entered them, but understand each and every one of us has been educated by what? The world. Do you guys know the story of the fallen angels and what they really did? Why what they did was wrong? You know, it's one thing being made eternal. They were made eternal. They were made to intercede for man, not for man to intercede with them. They were made eternal. They wanted to have children. They loved their children. The problem was this. They prematurely gave man instant information, ways and everything else, and they were not mature enough to handle knowing everything. They began to destroy each other. Even now, because we still have war, we are not mature enough to handle what's been given to us. The Lord purposed humanity to learn things over time as they were able to deal with it. That would be like you giving a five-year-old a machete to play with or one of your guns or rifles. The child does not have enough wisdom to properly use it. Technology is the same way. Technology can be both, it can increase the quality of life or it can destroy multiple lives. And the world teaches everybody to support its cause. So when we operate with the mentality of the world, we essentially are utilizing the teachings of something not good. 
But when we utilize the knowledge in the, in the Bible, which is why we have to labor in the Word, because it's not so easily captured. We stumble and fall and debate and everything else, and then we come full circle to the truth, only to find out the Holy Spirit teaches the truth. But if we can adopt that into our lives and begin to employ it, we can operate as an effective body in Christ. I'm not just talking about those in the chat room. I'm talking about every single believer on planet Earth. That is very needed. You know, really, it somewhat disturbs me this lesson. People come together. People come together. And yes, I'm going here to use an example. People come together for wrongful death of anybody. They come together under one umbrella, one cause, right? But for the life of me, they will not come together with that same type of passion, with that same type of integrity, with the same level of energy, with the same thought that justice must prevail. They will not come together with that mindset inside the body of Christ. They won't do it. Can you imagine if the body got together for a real cause for any one of us in here that's in trouble? Imagine if, if uh, how many people are on there? Imagine if, if, if 1,300, 1,400 people got together for the sake of one of you for anything in your life. Can you imagine the outcome? But the problem is we don't trust one another because we don't trust one another because we're still looking at the flesh. We're still judging and looking after the flesh. A lot of us don't know how to look into the intent of another individual. Once we get past our own flesh, once we subdue our own emotion, because some emotions are not good, they're part of the flesh. Once we do this, we can see clearly our brother and sister. If they mourn, we know they're mourning. Some of us are there already. We know when some, something is wrong with someone around us. We want to respond, but we have to go a step further. We have to actually respond. We do. When we respond, we have to give sound instruction. Sound instruction comes from the Word of God. It does not come from our own individual thoughts. It comes from the Word of God. The Lord is good. He knows that His children never will combine collectively. They won't bond unless trouble forces them to. Have you ever noticed in every single story in the Bible, it took a tumultuous time to do three things. One, to filter off those who were never walking with him in the first place. Two, to bring them closer together because danger is all around and they had no choice but to be closer together. And when they were closer together, they began to learn one another and appreciate who their brother and sister was. And then collectively they gave God praises and he ultimately got the glory out of the situation. If we don't have trouble in our lives, we simply won't seek him out. We seek him out because of trouble. How long are we going to do that? If we could seek him with that same veracity and honesty and integrity and meekness and humility, coming to him with a full heart of repentance in a time of good, can you imagine what he would do for his children? But he's a good father. He knows that in trouble we sober up. We're not sober unless we're in bad trouble. The fact is this. We do not know how. We're not mature enough to handle absolute freedom. Not yet. This is why we still sin. This is why we still take steps backwards sometimes. This is why we get caught up in the moment. We have not stepped away or subdued our flesh 100%. And so trouble is coming, not in the way you would think. All trouble that comes against God's children is for God's children. You have to know that. All trouble that comes against God's children is for God's children. It is not designed for your destruction. Let me give you a visual. Let's take some sheep and some wolves, right? Wolves are hunting the sheep. No other predator around, they will hunt methodically until they find one they don't have to work so hard for. But if a human comes out there, or from a distance, and fires a shot into the air, the wolves are terrified. The sheep are too, but the wolves are terrified. And they instantly go from hunting to running. When the trouble comes, the wolves that were once inside the body of Christ will run away. They'll expose themselves because they run in packs. The sheep will be nervous and scared too until they recognize who fired the shot. And we do have wolves in the camp. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about something on an entirely different level. Something much worse than a person. Spiritual things that people don't like to believe in. Spiritual influence. Spiritual influences that brush against us every day and we ignore them. See, most people don't think hatred is a big deal. They don't think when they feel hate 
super high moments of rage in their life. That's not a big deal. I'm telling you now, that's a huge deal. Your eyes are designed to see in this dimension. Your spiritual eyes can sense and see everything. If one demonic entity is usually a legion itself, how much damage can that thing do? If it were not for the Holy Spirit and God's authority within you, many people would be torn to shreds. Yet we play and walk outside of our salvation too many times. We're still getting caught up in the same scenarios in our lives. Time for us to break away. I can't be the only one feeling the same message. It's time for us to break away, not giving any room or excuses to the flesh. It's time for us to break away. I think that every day I feel that stronger and stronger. Because if we don't, calamity may come close to us. We can no longer afford to let the flesh dictate our lives as children of the Most High. Die to your flesh daily does not mean preserve it. It means die to it daily. It's lust. It's pride. You see, we fight against things that are exposed. When the Holy Ghost exposes something within us, we instantly fight against it. It's almost like a natural reaction of self-preservation. And if you attempt to preserve what you think you are, you're also attempting to save your life. And Jesus said those who try to save their lives, those who seek to save their lives will lose it. Those who lose their lives for his sake will find it. Does that make sense to you now? What identity are we preserving that's worth anything if it's outside who we are as a child of God, which is the true you, by the way? Here's an analogy. People come out of their houses, they feel one way. They get into the car and start it up and drive down the street, and people notice them in the car. But what they don't realize is that they're noticing and admiring the car, not them. But the driver in the car starts to feel good about it. They're feeling good because someone admired their vehicle. And it works the opposite, too. You can get in a vehicle, and someone can, won't pay you any attention because of the vehicle and it will dictate your emotional being. Don't let your vehicle, called your body, dictate who you are spiritually, because there's a battle already happening. People can feel it, they just can't find it. They can't quite find what's happening. But don't think of it as a loss. It is not a loss. It's not something that's going to defeat you. That's not the purpose of it. In order for you to get through these times, you're going to have to believe and know that your Father has you in mind. You're going to have to know that scripture that says, All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. And in fact, if you are predestined, you have a purpose. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that means God gave you to Jesus. That means you have a purpose. That means you are predestined. And in that respect, all things will work together for your good. Let the process be completed. Don't be intimidated when you don't know what to say. Your father is still in control. He has you in mind. And yes, it is a father-child relationship. How many two-year-olds feel really bad because they disappointed their parents? Hardly ever. Never happens, right? Not for a two-year-old in most cases. But the older you get, the more you realize what you could have done. Don't let that be used against you. See, Satan will remind you of your shortcomings all the time. The Holy Spirit will convict you. Conviction and an accusation of your past are two different things. Conviction means if you do something wrong, you feel it. You feel bad for it. Well, that's good. Accusing is when all your shortcomings, though you're striving as best you can, all your shortcomings are bought to your brain. Situations you can no longer change. Things that were outside of your control are thrown into your face to take away your joy. Satan comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to kill your hope, steal your joy, destroy your salvation. The only way he can make you destroy your own salvation is if he causes you in some form or fashion to fall away from the faith. He's trying to do that. He can't touch you directly, but he talks very well. He maneuvers very well. He understands the flesh intimately. He knows about seducing people. He knows how to situate words together to cause curiosity. He knows how to enchant you. He enchanted Eve in the garden. He beguiled her. Enchantment beguiled her. But collectively together, we can truly set billions to fly. So, don't be soon shaken by what you see in the world. It's going to build. You shouldn't have fear. It's happening right now. And some people, you know what? Some people are looking at the news and they're 
thinking in their mind. What would I do if that were in my neck of the neighborhood? What would I do if I were in that situation? You know what? You can attempt to prepare for many things that does not mean you're ready. But I do know this. When the time comes, the Holy Spirit will teach you and will instruct you on what you need to do. That's why it's important for us to stay on purpose, stay on mission, as we say. Collectively, we can do that. I'll explain something to you. The Lord gives you dominion over your own vessel, your own body. You know that? Your body is subject to you. You're not subject to your body. Your body is subject to you. Your body is exposed to things every day. But whether you acknowledge something like you're exposed to, you start thinking the worst, and your thoughts get out of control, and this time together. That's normally when we send our bodies out of whack. Most people limit who the Father is in their lives. Why? Because they're living in that two-dimensional piece of paper. Don't think that way. Don't fall for those tricks, those ancient tricks of the enemy, to say that you have no control, to say that the Lord is not coming to rescue you in this. Don't let him trick you like that. Don't let him make you doubt the Father's hand upon your life. Don't let him doubt. Don't, don't let him make you doubt your own authority that's given to you. Understand that you can no longer afford to trust your eyes. If you can't trust your eyes because of the multitude of deceptions, then tune your ears to the Spirit. How do you do that? How do you hear the Spirit better? Turn down the world. That's how you do it. And if you don't believe that, let's go investigate. I admit to you now that the if you're thinking about the world and worldly matters too much, it can choke the Word of God from your life. Let's go invest. We're going to investigate this. I'm going to show you by Scripture that that is a very true thing, very destructive thing. Now let's see if I can find it here. Let's see if I can find it. I like these small principles. You know, once you get them inside, you begin to utilize them. You find yourself walking in situations and scenarios you never thought you could possibly walk in. And you are. You really do become like a child. Because as you walk in the ways of Christ, and you acknowledge what he's given to you, and you see it affect things in your life. You see the effect of it in your life. Your trust level multiplies and multiplies. But for some of us, we refuse to do it. Of all the things on earth, we trust ourselves. That is the problem. How many times have we failed ourselves? How many times have our decisions led us to nothing good? How many times? Yet you know what we do? We go back and do the same thing again. Let me give you my definition of insanity. You ready? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. That's insanity. That would be like you hitting your hand with a hammer. And you say, next time it's not going to hurt. So you hit it again. You've broken all the bones in your hand. You keep doing it. That's insane. You can't lean onto your own understanding and get a bad result. Then lean onto your own understanding a second time, get a bad result, and continue to do so until you get a good result. Trust the Father. Follow His words. His words are perfected. Don't let Satan make you doubt them simply because you don't understand them. Apply what you do know. Hold fast to that which you have. Hold on to it. Work with what you have, and things will be added to that. If you do not work with what you have, even that that you have will be taken away. That's also scripturally founded. Those are the little mystery scriptures that some people think about. You know what? I'm trying to find this. I know it's in here. Come on, Lord, show me where it is. Oh, here it is. See, I found it. It's in Luke chapter 8. You ready? Let's, let's check this out. Luke chapter 8, 11 says, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Now this is talking about sowing seed. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and take the way of the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. That's the first episode of how the word can be taken from you. You know how people walk around and say, well, no one can take anything from me. Well, that's a lie, because someone can take something from you when you let things overcome you. Let's continue. The seeds that land on a rock, Luke chapter 8, 13, they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. These have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. In a time of temptation, they fall away. You know, the word says a man is, is um, tempted and drawn away of his own lusts, right? Temptation resides within a person. Nothing externally can tempt you if it's not within you. Do you understand that? 
If you have no desire to electrocute yourself, no one can tempt you to put your fingers in a wall socket. However, if you have a death wish or your curiosity is very blind, someone could tempt you to do that. A lack of knowledge can bring people into great temptation. If you don't know that electricity can destroy your body, you may be tempted to touch those wires. Maybe that's why the Lord specifically said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I know I use a lot of comparisons and analogies and so forth, but sometimes the word is very simple and so true that we miss the entire thing. We miss things in the word because we have not attempted to apply it in our lives. See, I have many lumps. I have a multitude of lumps. My lumps come from understanding the word, yet not putting it into practice. And then I get to see the negative outcome. Now, I told you guys before, I'm not going to talk about a subject I do not intimately know. David had many lumps. Moses had a giant lump. All of them had shortcomings. Solomon, the wisest person that ever was, he had a multitude of lumps. But you see, when you apply God's word, when you're young, you want to see it work, right? Yet you still want to have fun. That's where the lumps come from. You believe in it, but you get carried away. You get carried away. You may have knowledge, but you have no wisdom, no ability to apply that knowledge. As you get older, you begin to look in other people's lives and you say, Wow, I see where they're going, but I can't say a word. And the only thing I can tell them is from the scriptures. I have to do it with love so they'll hear me. It does no good to force a scripture on anybody if it's not done with true compassion. Except for those scriptures that are released into the world when you're dealing with principalities and powers. That's very different. When you're dealing with your brothers and sisters, you want them to hear. No one's going to hear if they are deeply offended or provoked. You know, when it says, parents, do not provoke your children to wrath, we do it with our brothers and sisters all the time. We provoke them to wrath, and then we say, see, they won't listen to anything. That's not the way. Anyway, let's continue. And that which fell among thorns, which when they heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So you're, you're, you're looking at scenarios in which the word of God is taken. Let's look at 8.14 again. Seeds sown, and they fall among thorns. And it says in 8.14, And that which fell among thorns, the seed that fell among thorns, which is describing them, when they have heard, when they have heard, they go forth. But they're choked with the cares and the riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Listen to me, let me say that again. With the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. Now the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life, you can sum those up in two words. You know what that is? Self-preservation. When you're serving yourself, you have deep cares about this life because you want it perpetuated for your sake. You want riches in this life so that you can feed the lust of your flesh. You want pleasures of this life so you can enjoy yourselves. Have you ever heard someone say, well, you know, you have to take the time to enjoy yourself sometimes. Just you and do what you want to do and then the Lord will understand. Have you ever heard that? That's an abomination statement. Listen, I'm going to give you my two cents here. I absolutely, and you may have that impression already, but I absolutely believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I absolutely know His way works. I know what faith can do. I know what real prayer can do real prayer. Also, I know what the devil does to attempt to make you feel your ways won't work. So, I'm going to go over some of those things tomorrow because you need to learn how to overcome and deal with these spirits and let loose. I'll give you a hint too. If you ever feel depression, if confusion hits your mind over a situation, it's not normal to do such things. It's not normal. It's influenced by something you do not see. There are deceivers all around us all the time and it takes you to actually stand up and trust and i tell you what the holy spirit is conveying to me the idea of trust you're going to hear other ministers say the same thing trust we need absolute trust you cannot exercise any authority if you do not trust that authority because you won't do it you have the authority but if you are living this in this world with authority, yet you never use that authority because you don't trust the Almighty God. You don't trust what the Lord Jesus, the instructions he gave us. 
Your walk in this world is a victim. You don't have to walk in this world as a victim. You need to walk as a child of the creator. Listen, listen to this term. You're a child of the creator of all things. You're a child of his. Why does he call you a child? Because you're made after his image, after his likeness. The characteristics that reside within him are within you. You're a child. You're not an orphan. You're a child of the creator of all things. Uh, let's use an analogy. You're walking around in New York City. You, you don't have a dime in your pocket. You're hungry and starving. You know you can't go into a restaurant because you have no money. You beg and you plead on the side of the road, and then you starve to death and you die because you never knew that your parent was the owner of all the restaurants, all the banks, all the malls, and everything else. All you had to do was go into the door and ask for it. But if you don't ask, or if you don't know that you have that ability, if you don't know who you are, you'll never attempt to walk outside what the world has presented to you. Your Heavenly Father is the creator of all things. You are his child. Time for us to stand up as children of the Most High. Time for us to stand up. And it takes trust. Trust gets rid of fear. Trust gets rid of worry. It gets rid of fear because when you trust, if you trust in the Almighty, you know he loves you. And if you know he loves you, the love within you becomes perfected by his love. And perfect love casts out all fear. What is perfect love? His love towards you. His love towards you is perfect love. That's why small infants, little toddlers, tear into terrible twos. They really don't fear anything. That's why it's called the terrible twos. Because at that point, when they reach a certain age, they have absolute trust in you. Right? And if they have absolute trust in you, they're walking around fearless. This is why young people walk around fearless. They have trust and they don't want to really go away from home or go away from those places of security because they have absolute trust. We can have that same trust in our behavior and in, in our Father and our behavior will change accordingly. However, if we listen to the words of Satan, here are the words of Satan. Satan has been allowed to implement situations in your life so that you can have an honest choice. It is not your destiny to give in to what Satan has said to you throughout your whole life. He spoke through many people trying to get to you. He's manifested in situations attempting to get to you. He's manifested in sickness attempting to get to you. But listen, you have to have an honest choice. All of it's for the glory of God. Anything for the glory of God is for his children. Why? Because he commanded his love towards you. And if he commanded his love towards you, all these things that are working are for you. Just like a good parent works, is a provider, shelters, and everything else. They're concerned about their children. So he is concerned about you on an individual basis. This is why he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows all about you because he pays attention to you consistently, continually. He doesn't take his eyes off of you. He pays attention to you. I say this to scientists, unanswered prayers bring no glory to him. I say this. I say that when the Father does not answer a prayer, we can't say he didn't answer. I can say this. Sometimes he requires us to wait. Oftentimes when we pray for something, he doesn't just put a band-aid over something. He may be preparing hundreds of people for the sake of that prayer. We have to be patient and wait. We glorify God. We do. And so things in our lives that are forming as we grow brings him glory. But sometimes when we pray and do not receive right away is because we have to have patience. Saul did not have patience and he sought out another way. He was punished for doing so. Daniel prayed. Daniel fasted. He did not get an instant answer. Though the angels specifically said God heard him when he set his heart toward the matter. And the angel fought his way through to Daniel. He was delayed 21 days getting to this realm. And the other prayers are like Jake. JCD said, sometimes we pray and don't receive because we ask the mystic to consumer for us. But the Father's concern for us, we can't fathom. But we need to function as children. He gave us the instruction. He told us how to perform those instructions with humility and meekness and all love and faith and patience and long suffering, doing things in kindness, doing things in the way of our Lord. Yeah, I agree with that, uh, signs. Absolutely. 
covered some of that yesterday. Because, see, I believe in the power of the Most High. I know what the salvation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. Because I've lived through that salvation. My soul bears witness to what that power in the blood actually means. That's why I don't walk around angry, evil, depressed, upset, and all these other things. You know why? Because the Lord said that I could subdue my flesh. He told me to die to my flesh daily. I don't let my emotions rule me. I put them under subjection. If your car engine is idling too high and it wants to jump in the first gear and take off, what do you do? You turn the car off. You need to do your flesh the same way. The flesh is very noisy, just like the world. But turn it off so that we can hear what the true things are. You have that power to do that. You can place your flesh under subjection. But if you listen to the world and its wisdom, it tells you to magnify the flesh, be proud of it, preserve it, have it presentable in the way of the world. It wants you to be vain, to worship it, to worship other people's vessels. That's what the world teaches. All this flesh in this world will certainly burn up or die one day. It's going to return to dust. It's not permanent. The temporary rental car is what it is. And it will one day be no good. But you are an eternal being. You're an eternal being. Place your flesh under subjection. Even when it gets nervous, begin to put those things, those emotions, under subjection to the power bestowed upon you by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Within salvation is a multitude of things that many leave undiscovered because they won't search them out in Scripture. And after they find them, they certainly won't apply them. People say, well, I have to live in the real world. I understand what the scriptures are saying, but this is reality. Statements like that are destructive at its core. They're very destructive. I won't speak like that. I don't operate like that. Even when I look foolish, I'll stand firm to what's written in the Word. And you know what? The Word is never wrong. Never wrong. People misuse scriptures. They do. They misuse scriptures. The world does against you to deplete your faith because you don't understand. A great many people do not understand that your faith is like oxygen. You see, if you don't have oxygen for your body, it'll shut down, eventually die. It's a small thing to have oxygen. It's a very small thing we take for granted. We need oxygen. We can't see it or anything else. Faith is the same way. Satan does not want you to use your faith. And how, how does he do that? By making you have an identity crisis. He wants you to identify with everybody but the Lord. He does not want you to realize who you are. He doesn't want you to review the scripture that says, Among many things, Jesus came that he may be the first of many brethren. Did you hear that, brethren? He doesn't want you to read the scripture, You're joint heirs with Christ. You know why? Because that puts you on this quality level well above him. But even Jesus was tempted by who? Satan himself. And whatever he did to Jesus, he's going to attempt to do to you. But look, Satan was used to accomplish the purpose of the Father for all of his children. Judas Iscariot was selected purposely. Jesus knowing full well who he selected. He knew full well who he selected. But no one, no one will rightfully begin to walk in things unless they apply it to their lives. It has to be applied to your life. Just like a little arm exercise. Hoping and wishing it's going to go up. But then you press the A key and something happens. I identify scoffers guess 419 because that's what they're known as. Scoffers and mocks. I don't accuse them. I identify them as such. I don't have any information on the scoffer to accuse them. You have to accuse someone with information. I have no information. That's identification. That's like saying, uh, you know, ISIS is not a very good group. That's identification. To accuse someone is to bring up anything they have done and use it against them. That's the route Satan takes. I'm not perfected, so I can't judge. Yeah, I can be identified. Everybody can be identified. But guess what? I am identified with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some people have fear already, just by the small things that are happening. There's no room for fear when you trust in the Lord. No room for fear. No room at all. Also, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? 
if you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.